And today is a special day because we get to celebrate, and I know a lot of you knew Bonnie Hiddle probably, and uh, we get to celebrate a very, very nice donation that their family gave to the museum. And Lisa is here and is going to share something about her mom. And before she does that, I have to introduce her brother back there, because Dennis is back here and Connie next to him, his wife. And so it's kind of a celebration of uh, lots of good things. So uh, just in case you wonder how in the world did we come up with this, Gloria Albrecht, yes. and Gloria had planned to be here. She just was released kind of tentatively Friday to begin driving because she had knee replacement. And she said, I'm going to be there on Monday. So we'll see how that works. <laughs> but anyway, she was doing all the 150, and Lisa happened to catch up on the pictures and went down to Gloria and said, hey, Mom had this collection. Would you be interested? And then we ended up with it here at the museum, which is really, really nice. So thank you to the Hill family for doing that. And I'm going to do Lisa, and she's going to talk a little bit about her mom, and then we're going to see some of the pictures. She had over 500 postcards in these books up here, and afterwards you're welcome to come up and, and take a look at, at those pictures, and lots of them had little notes or other information on the back, and some of that will be shared too. So, Lisa. Children and grandchildren, 
uh, of both sides of our family. She was able, when she started it, to interview many of the elders who were still living and had many memories and stories to share that had she not put those all down, they, they would be lost to us. Um, she also uh, spent many, many hours doing research. Uh, once they had internet available, Dennis and I were just talking about this, she basically just taught herself how to get on and use the internet. And uh, that helped her collect these postcards somewhat. And she, uh, her glassware, she became friends all over the place. She researched, like I said, our family history on both sides. And they, she and my dad traveled to Denmark um, to meet relatives that she found that way on her side of the family and back to Virginia on my dad's side of the family uh, to research uh, family history back there. Um, and I, we all really appreciate the work that she did on that. So my brother Dennis and I talked about this postcard collection. <laughs> How did this start? Why did it start? How, when did it start? And uh, Dennis thinks, and I agree with him, that what happened was once my dad retired, he didn't have a lot of hobbies, but he started collecting cast iron skillets, door stops, anything made of cast iron. Because I think he thought it was a great investment. It was really going to appreciate. It did not. <laughs> and then he had a whole shed full of it that my mom had to figure out what to do with. But they would go to these flea markets to, uh, and maybe auctions or uh, estate sales to, to collect cast iron. And I, we think that's probably where my mom first started looking at postcards and finding Winfield postcards and getting uh, interested in that. Um, she was a member of the Wichita Postcard Club for many years, and she would come up. I know even while I lived in Wichita, she would often come up for their shows and sales and, uh, you know, look for Winfield postcards there and talk to the dealers, and they would search for Winfield postcards, and uh, she, spent, she spent a lot of time uh, doing that. Um, my mom really, really loved Winfield, and I'm sure that she would be really happy to know that her cards are here at the museum for everyone to enjoy and learn from. And have to thank Dennis, because when I talked to Gloria at the 150th celebration about the postcards, I didn't know where they were. <laughs> and Dennis had them and said, here you go. And I thought there would be like a notebook full, but no, there were multiple notebooks full of Winfield postcards. So uh, I think we found the right place for them to be. And uh, one more thing, if you want to put up um, that other slide, yeah. Uh, Gloria posted on the Winfield Facebook site, oh, months ago, this picture and said, I don't know anything about this picture, but I just think it's fascinating. And she told me that she saw it here at the museum, so I don't know where it is, but uh, it, was a, it was the photograph, not the postcard, but this photograph had, has been, had been made into postcards, which I know I have one in my book, I think you guys do too. Uh, and my mom wrote a story about this postcard, which I'm not going to read the whole story, but I'll read the last of it so that you kind of know the history of this. Um, Maria Brown is pictured in the photo with her faith faithful horse, Old Blue. <laughs> My, my mother, this was my mom writing this, so my grandmother, her mother, often recalled the story of seeing Maria riding in the buggy and driving Old Blue on the country road in Winfield where she traded eggs and butter for the family groceries. In the background, we see the old Winfield Hospital then located at 201 Banning. This card is dated September 14, 1911. Uh, after the death of her husband, Maria Brown sold the farm and moved into town. And as a child, I remember her gentle and kind personality, which is typical of the Danish people. Uh, Maria Brown gave me the gift of a 
lifetime, that being my Danish heritage. By now, the reader must know that Maria Clausen Brown was my beloved paternal grandmother. Uh, I had the privilege of visiting her homeland in Denmark in 1993. I knew that I had then come full circle, and my mom always said this was her favorite of the postcards. So, I'm going to turn it over to Cindy.
to construct and operate a small steam generator to provide Winfield with electricity for light and power. And the city took over the electric power plant in 1904, and this is the cool part. While the Winfield people were enjoying the Chautauqua Assembly in the summer of 1905, the lights were turned on for the first time. And so this became the light way at night. And I think it's so cool because they ask all the businesses and the building owners to turn on their lights that night. So when they came from the assembly, the town was lit up. So I thought that was pretty cool. And these next two pictures really contrast Main Street between 1907 and 1953. Fun to see what it looks like in contrast. The next one. This shows a few of the businesses that were on Main Street. Uh, First National Bank, of course, you can see the steps going up and all the businesses that were in there. It wasn't just a bank building by any means. And they had a lot of businesses on the ground floor as well as in the basement. And then the next picture has a couple stories with it. If you look at the tallest building, that is upstairs the Manning Opera House. And Colonel E.C. Manning, who founded Winfield, soon after we were here, and it came in before the Grand Opera House, he decided, his wife actually decided we needed culture in Winfield. <laughs> and so, we had an opera house built, and then below that had been uh, the M.H. Hahn Clothing Company, where Dean's uh, menswear was later. But uh, next to it, and the postcard really highlights the root shoe store that was there. And I think it's so cool to see such a great big hand out there in the front. Uh, yeah, he used this to advertise his business. And uh, on the back of the card, he had even put this personal letter to people on the back of the card that said, Dear friend, and he signed it, yours for good shoes, was, and he could personally sign each one of them. And then a P.S. When at Winfield, make our store your headquarters. And a lot of businesses use that for advertising purposes. And that's what the Brown uh, Drug Company did, was to use that as an advertising piece. And uh, that was located uh, up there where, for those of you that have been with Field for a long time, it's up where Candyland and Baggage Drug Store and Hans Bakery were in that 800 block on the west side of the street. Uh, it's where uh, the Advantage Chiropractic is now and in that section. And then, of course, Kyger, that's an interesting car just because. Kyger decided they'd use one car to advertise both their businesses. <laughs> you know, why not? And so their undertaking business was actually where the city cigar store was. And so, and then Kyger where we know it. And so they used a process called overlaying and uh, put this postcard together. So that was kind of interesting. <laughs> and then, of course, this next one is uh, one of the trick business and it was located on the east side of the 700 block of Main Street. And Claude Tripp was the father of uh, Clara Embry. And in the postcard uh, books, you will find that there are several cards from Carol uh, Embry, and, or from Clara Embry. And so I don't know whether they were friends or how Bonnie might have gotten those, but there were quite a number in there from there. Uh, Mr. Tripp had real estate and trucks that picked up freight, and the ice was picked up at the ice plant on West 5th Street. Uh, later, <coughs> where Prairie Land ended up. Mr. Tripp himself owned most of the east side of the 700 block of Main. Okay, the next one. A few others we see up here, a state bank, and that's another one of those where they used it as an advertising piece. And at that time, the State Bank, this is dated 1909, and the State Bank was located on the east side of the street where Pierce's was and where Rice Dentistry is now. And then Alexander Milling, uh, many of you probably remember on uh, West 8th Street where Jarvis Auto was, that's where uh, the uh, 
Alexander Building Company was, and across the street to the west where there's a parking lot, they occupied all of that area. <laughs> um, and it faced south. You don't think about something like that right here in town, in the middle of town. And then, of course, there's a Caden lot, and the note on the back of the card said that the Caden uh, Monument Company was about midway down in those tower pieces, and uh, Bill Caton had, uh, she had acquired information from him on the back of the card. He said it was kind of interesting that Caton's was actually in three locations. It did not start in the Caton block. It actually started right north of the Episcopal Church, and then its second location was 206, 208 East Ninth on the north side of the street, and then Caton bought that, it, it was built originally by Hackney, and then there was a big fire that went through, and Caton bought, uh, bought the building and rebuilt it after the fire in 1901. And so they ended up with that uh, block through there. And then, uh, of course, I had to throw in Benny and Smith, because not downtown, but it was one of our major businesses for a long time from 1952 through 1997. So, okay, this next one is with the hospitals. And we've had three hospitals. We actually had four, but three of them that we always recognize. And the far right ones are the St. Mary's Hospital. And I don't know whether many of you would have known that it started out as a frame structure. And it was built in 1899. And uh, then the one on the lower right was built in 1918, just to the east. So the other one was still on 9th Street, just a little further to the west, according to what it says on the card. And then they built the brick one. And when they did that, they uh, tore off part of the old hospital. The remaining part was uh, used for the nurse's home. And the part that they tore off was the right side where the steps and the porch were of the old one. And I, she had several pictures of the hospital, but I like this one because of the snow. It just was such a perfect one. And then this lower right, of course, William Newton, and I liked, there's a lot of pictures of William Newton, but I like this one because of all the cars in the front of it. It just has that special look. The one on the very top left is a Winfield Hospital. And I think you said in the background of that other was a Winfield Hospital that was over here on Thames. And uh, there was a small piece of it left, just the very, very east part of it, and that's used as apartments today. And it's interesting to note that all three hospitals had a nursing school as well. And St. John's had a nursing school, and later when they closed, Southwestern had a nursing school. So all of the medical piece in Winfield, that's been pretty important from the very beginning. Okay, the next one. Schools in Winfield, education was really important. Like I said, Manning wanted culture in Winfield, but he also wanted education. Even in the old log, how, the old log school, they had a, a school to begin with when we were founded in 1870. So the first school was a central school, and as our population began to increase, they would add on uh, more space, and eventually the high school went into the second floor, as I understand it. That was where the industrial building, I think, went in that has been torn down, and that's where. The fire department? No, the police department. Yeah. Whatever, that space in there. Um, and then the high school itself was built in uh, several segments. The first brick, uh, brick high school was built in 1910, and that was the west part. And then the second was built in 1926, and notice the cars in front. There are a lot of pictures of the high school, but I love this one because of the cars that were in the front. And schools tended to be the place where you got lots of events that would happen. And Maypole winding 
was a very big event. In fact, Southwestern used to have a May Fade, and they wound in April. So for a long time, that was a really big deal, and this was held out in the street by the Woodfield High School. Um, South Vernon School was founded way back, and of course our county had a lot of county schools. And I don't know whether uh, we only had this one of a rural school, and it might be because, I don't know, did they live out in that area where South Vernon was? I have no idea. But anyway, this picture is... Okay. Yeah, okay. 1894 was when this South Vernon school was, was built. And I think from what it said, it was a little confusing on the back, but it sounded like it had originally been in a different location and then was moved to where you know the Brick South Vernon School. It was moved to that location and uh, then after the uh, Brick Building of South Vernon that we know was built, uh, then this 1894 South Vernon School was moved to the Ward, Ward O'Neill Farm to be used as a barn or a shed. So it was repurposed, not turned down. And then the bottom two, Bryant School and Lowell School, look at how many students they had. <laughs> Classrooms were crowded. <laughs> okay, the next picture shows some of our colleges, and we had a couple of them downtown in addition to these, but these are the ones that we usually think about for the most part, of St. John and Southwestern. And uh, the picture at the top of the right-hand side is Bain Hall, 1907, and the picture right below it is St. John's Gym, and it was built in 1945. And the two at the top of Southwestern are interesting. At the low, in the lower middle part, you see the first building that was at Southwestern, which was North Hall. And then they began to build Richardson. And the one in the middle at the top shows the building of Richardson. And that particular one is interesting because if we had been able to enlarge it, which I did at home, and Judy has scanned all of these, and she enlarged them to take a good look at them, too. You can see there's a big crowd of people. And the reason is, it was the laying of the cornerstone of Richardson, which was really interesting. And according to the back of the card, the way in the background was to be the chapel. And then the picture over here of Richardson on the back of that card, it said, this is the way this new building looked about a month ago. And it was dated 1910. Oh, wow. And it was taken from the second story of Old North Hall down here. And then the picture down here is Smith Hall, which I remember when I went to Southwestern. I didn't live there, I lived in Wallingford. But it was a dorm that was there for a number of years on the campus. And she's got a lot of other pictures from the, both campuses. Okay, next picture, next one. <coughs> okay, there were a lot of government buildings in Winfield, and uh, both county and uh, uh, city buildings. And we see up here uh, the Caton Block, well, not the Caton Block, we see the fire department. And up until, well, this one is about 1901. And the city building was also located where the fire department was. It was in the back part, as I understand it. Maybe it was there for quite a long time, from what I heard. Uh, the, middle, the middle one and this upper one are the same building. It was repurposed. It was built as a Young Men's Christian Association building and the postmark of 1907. And then the upper right shows that same building. It was repurposed as a Chamber of Commerce building, and that was in 1957. And then the county... Where was it? 10th of Melon. 10th of Melon. Across the street from the old post. Yeah. 
over years. the parking lot. And then I think there was a fire that eventually yes. is where that, it was located where the parking lot is behind the chambers. And then the county courthouse was always in that same block. Uh, and this one is the second courthouse. It was built in 1909. And then the jail was also built that same year. Bill told me that, yep, that Brick County Jail went in the same year they built the courthouse in 1909. <clears throat> and the county sheriff and his family lived downstairs in the front with the jail on top. Wouldn't you have loved that? <laughs> uh, okay, next one. Island Park, and when it first started, it was known as Chautauqua Park. And it's got such a rich history. In fact, one of our Gloria Grover paper about Island Park a few years ago for the Celebrate County County History, and she's got so many pictures of Island Park. It's just amazing. And if you look in here in these postcards, there's also a lot of pictures of Island Park through the years. And I really like the one on the top because in the middle because it shows all those buildings that were there over the years. And this particular one is dated 1909. But all of those are different buildings. And you look at Island Park now, and somebody said, we don't want to build anymore. It'd be too crowded. And I'm thinking, that had to be pretty crowded. <laughs> That's a lot of buildings. And of course, the band shell. But notice the two little boys that are on bikes sitting there listening to the concert. And then the Tabernacle hosted many events, and this picture is dated 1915, and it was celebrating the honor that Winfield had received as the best town in which to raise children. And then, of course, those others, I just had to show that bottom one because the crowds that were in Island Park for Chautauqua and the events and how they dressed, even in summer. It was not flip-flops and shorts and <laughs> go comfy. It was you dressed up. <laughs> and then the WCTU building is down here at the bottom, and that was the, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And they were very active at that time. So uh, they had their own building on the east side as you went into the park. And then this other one is the entrance. And it looks so different. You can tell this is from very, very early, the entrance to the park. And then the next one, the train and the trolleys and the inner urban. Uh, with the train arrival, Winfield became a town because of the train. 1879, it came in. And eventually, we had four railways that served Winfield. This top picture up here is the Southern Kansas Railroad, and I don't think I've ever seen another postcard of that particular uh, railroad. So that was interesting. Uh, then we have, of course, the Santa Fe demonstration train, and on the back it said it was reported more than 5,000 people came to see this train, as far away as 20 miles. <laughs> yeah, and that was more than a day's trip. You know. Schools were dismissed, and many of the stores closed, so everyone had an opportunity to see them. And it stayed in Winfield for about an hour and a half, and then it departed for Ark City. So it was a big deal. Um, and then, of course, we have our 14th Street uh, Santa Fe Station Depot, and there's a lot of pictures of that, of different ones from the depot, but I happen to like that one. I'm not sure why I got to that one. And then Winfield has had a trolley system from the 1880s. And the first ones were, of course, pulled by donkeys uh -huh. and, uh, or horses. And the last trip made by the donkeys was in 1909 because after that, the electric trolley system came in, and we were really uptown. <laughs> and this picture is uh, October of 1911, and in the middle on the bottom, showing the first trip made by the interurban loading freight. And then this other one, 
the inner urban running between Winfield and Orange City. And in order to have that inner urban happen, Gary, correct me if I'm wrong, they had to take the old electric trolley traps that we had. And by the way, what's interesting is our trolley system in Winfield never changed. The path that the donkeys took, they used <coughs> it for our trolley system, our electric trolley system. When the inner urban came in, they reworked those trolley tracks to make them work for the inner urban rail cars. Am I right? Correct. They were the wrong gauge. Yeah. As well as being too light for the heavier electric. Yeah. So they had to rework those in Winfield, and I think they probably had to in Ark City as well in order Some for, it, yes. for that to work. And it was like a railroad uh, between the two towns, regular runs. Okay, the next one. You can't have anything without the fairgrounds, and there's lots of fairgrounds pictures. Uh, I love it because it's been a place to go since right after Winfield was founded. They started out with a fair out there, and today it's still the place to go. So these pictures were all taken. Uh, they are all dated, uh, I think, 1908. And so we see the carnival, and we see the horse races, and then we see the car races, and I want you to look up there. I don't know whether you can see it or not, but you can see where it says Brown Sisters Millinery on the sign. It was located at 918 Main, and at that time, there were millineries everywhere. They were popular, they did big business, and people said, what in the world is a millinery? But if you notice, they all have these fancy hats, and they are all custom-made, so why not? And then, of course, now everyone, if you sit, just say Winfield, they think festival. And this one is a picture from the 1976 Fifth National Flat Picking Championship. Pretty small compared to what our Roman Valley Festival is now. And then churches. Oh my goodness, we had so many pictures of churches, but so many of these have changed locations at that time. But I think one of my favorites is right there at the top because that Baptist church under it, it says, Churches on Church Street. <coughs> and Millington was known as Church Street. And we began to look at it today and we realized Millington is still Church Street, because a lot of them have moved and gone other places, but others have taken their place, so it's still Church Street. And so the churches that are pictured is the Episcopal, the Baptist in the middle, Bay Memorial, which was a Lutheran, 1913, Bethel AME, the Presbyterian, the Christian Church from 1913, the Catholic Church, the Methodist of 1914, and notice it even says, built for 50000 And the <laughs> Christian <laughs> Science, 1911. And so many of them had the big domes or the big steeples. And they moved, a lot of them after floods and things moved and rebuilt in other locations. But it's kind of fun to look back at the old ones people remember. And then the last three slides, I just went through and I picked from random categories. Just some random buildings and things that were important to the history of Winfield. And the first one is the Luther's Children's Home. Was at Adelaide Bay and had a big part in establishing that home. And this postcard was dated 1910. And there was another postcard that Joanne and I found in there. And it said the home for unwanted children. Aww. Isn't that sad? And it was the sweetest little ki baby carriage and a little one. Yeah. The public library uh, was a Carnegie library built in 1912. And according to the information on the back, it cost 12000 to build. And today, of course, it's on the National Historic Place, uh, Registry of Historic Places. And then we have... Uh, down on that corner is another a favorite of mine, it was called the City of Trees, but I like it because if you look down closely, it's a corner of 
night in college and you see a trolley on the street. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I like it. And then you can, of course, see right down 9th Street, which is really neat. And then uh, you couldn't have any of them without the Grand Opera House. And there were a number of pictures of the, of the Opera House. Uh, and it had its uh, grand opening in uh, 1888. And it celebrated their grand opening. And in our museum picture archive, you've got a picture of it, of the Gypsy Baron Company. And that's what they opened with. And a picture of the cast that was in that, that was kind of interesting. And then the College of Music and later the Southwestern College of Music were located above what down below later became the Regent Theater. And then the Country Club, of course, Fred Clark had a big part in establishing that. But I like this picture because of all the old cars. Can you tell I just get kind of drawn in when I see the old cars in the pictures? Above is the Winfield State Hospital, and there are a number of pictures of the Winfield State Hospital. This one happened to show so many of the buildings, and so we enjoyed that one a lot. Um, some of them have titles below that would be very offensive to us today, but that's the way they referred to those folks at that time, you know, which is not exactly politically correct today. But they were the postcard, and that was the culture of the time. Where was the opera house? It was on the corner where Hometown Lumber is now. And there is still a pillar there left for the opera house. Which is what? Nine Man and Ten. Nine Man and Ten, yeah. On the corner of Hump Town. Hump Town. Eleven. Eleven. Twelve. Twelve. Eleven. Eleven. It's on the east side. It's on the east side on the corner. Our western auto store used to be there. Rent to own. Not the Hump Town. In fact, here, Main Street is getting ready to put a uh, plaque up on the pillar once we get permission for Webb Rob to, to use that pillar because I think that's the other wall. They left one wall right there. And you can see part of the curve of the... Uh, yeah. And there's that, just that one big pillar there that we will end up putting in a story plaque on. Okay, and then... Yeah, we've got uh, next picture. A few more random places. Of course, you have to have the Brent Hotel because that was built in 1888 at a cost of 55000 and remodeled in 1900 at a cost of 15000 Cost 55 A few years later, they put another fifteen in, and they said the carpets alone cost 3000 according to the article in the Courier 1901 edition. And then it was torn down in 1969. And we have a room key from there. What? We have a room key from there. Oh, yes, we do. <coughs> that was found at Southwestern just randomly, and they were looking through, and somebody said, what is this? And it happened to be a room key from the Somebody's Red Hotel. So that's now a part of our museum. <laughs> we have we have a pillar on the stairs that come down the Britain Hotel. Yeah, and the, and the and the top comes off, and you can put liquor bottles down. <laughs> oh, there you go. Just a nice little speakeasy. It's in your liquor bottle. No, it's in the. It's in the we bought that at an auction. That's cool. Uh, there were a lot of pictures of the Lagonda Hotel, built in 1918. Uh, by a company from Chicago got the contract. And according to the courier, I love the way it was named. It was named the Lagonda as a way to remember the first Winfield Hotel, which stood at the corner of 8th and Main. Mm -hmm. And then the power plant, there's a lot of pictures of postcards in there of the power plant. It was built in 1905, expanded and modernized in 1925. And Lots of different pictures. This would happen to have some of the people in it, but there's a lot of different pictures of the power plant. As well as, uh, I don't think I put it in, maybe I did. Grant Stafford was a mansion, and it's over here where Walnut Towers is now, and that was a huge home or mansion. And I think the Snyder Research had their building 
on that same block, didn't they? Right, right. And right. there is a picture in a postcard in here of the Snyder Research. That's where the food for the school was prepared when we were building the park that's on on May on the May. Oh, right when, down, they, when they when they traveled when they were had yes, no homes. Yes, when we had the, <laughs> when we had the sheds out there. For the there you go. Those days. <laughs> It said it was remodeled in 1906, and they added the ballroom and the bathroom. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were nice. down by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and then the main home, and according, according to Adelaide, it was built uh, by John Peter Baden in about 1880, and her father, Martin, was about eight or nine when they moved in. And then she lived in that house next door that was built in 1900, the next door house to the east, uh, for Martin by his parents and given to them as a wedding gift. And then she said the large columns in front were added about 1913, so they were not original to the home. And this last one I like because it is so unique to think that a photographer went out and snapped a picture just looking down West 9th Street. You know, you don't find postcards like that. Is that a trolley coming down the street? Yes. I mean, can you even imagine? <coughs> what, what, did he know somebody down that street or why? And I guess that's why that just caught my attention. Okay, the last slide has a few activities or events that happen. The first one is an American Legion, and this card uh, was designed by Clara Embry's first husband in 1949, and Charles Cloud was the commander, and Jean Purcell of the State Bank is seated next to him. And then the middle one, the reservoir break in June of 1916, and that was truly devastating to the town in so many ways. What was that? Because it destroyed a lot. What was that? Uh, it was just to the east of, of St. John's up there because then it flooded and did a lot of destruction on the St. John's campus. But there's quite a number of pictures, postcards of the reservoir itself being built and everything. So that's really interesting when you find those. And then fishing on the walnut, this lower one of course shows all of them, look how they're dressed to fish. Uh, uh -huh. You go out of your Sunday best to, to fish on the dam on the wallet. And, then, and that one is dated 1912. The one on the far right uh, shows the troops leaving for Mexico in 1916. And they're boarding the train, the families, and you have to just almost feel the emotions that are going on when you look at that picture. And then the Odd Fellows Lodge members in 1917. And this top picture is one of my most favorite. And it was found in the dams and mills category. And it's just a man out there in 1905 enjoying fishing on one below one of the dams. And I'm not even sure which dam it is. It didn't even say. But there were a lot of mills in town and several different dams. So hopefully you kind of got a, a sense of the variety of postcards that are here. And you're welcome to stay and look at some of them or come back and look at them. We keep them in our archives in their way. And what a wonderful way to document history of a town. Without these postcards, it would be really hard because newspapers didn't carry very many photographs. It would be really hard for us to know what it is really like. You know, you can almost imagine yourself living in that time by looking at the postcards. <laughs>